Our scripture reading this afternoon is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. We'll be reading verses 47 through 65. As we continue in our exposition of the Gospel of Luke, we arrive at the moment at Gethsemane where Judas comes and fulfills the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And following verse 47 of Luke 22, hear God's own true and eternal word. And while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then took they him. And led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and where and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? The hour of darkness. That is the explanation the Lord Jesus gives to everything that we're considering and surrounding what we've been considering. The Lord Jesus said this phrase in verse 53 to those people who came to them, even offering, in essence, to them an explanation why they were there and offering an explanation to, to His apostles why all of that was happening. In verse 53 of chapter 22, the Lord Jesus says, When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is what Jesus is doing. He's, he's telling those people who came to arrest Him why they are there. It's, it's the hour of darkness. There's a reason why they are there. 
It is because now God has ordained that they will have an essence, in an hour. They will have a time. They will have a, a, a moment to act. And the reason God will allow them to act as they will is because it will serve God's purpose for providing a Savior to the world. This is what's astonishing. The reality that this hour that is theirs is still being operated by the eternity of God, not just an hour. God doesn't need an hour or a moment. But those people do. They, they are operating, as it were, in chains. And God is letting loose their chains for a little while. And when the chains are let loose, these are the things that happen. It's all this darkness and there's, there's a power to it. See, it is your hour and the power of darkness. Um, we're going to look at this passage under this theme because this is what explains the arrest that is happening right now and the betrayal that is right part of this arrest and then the denial of Peter and we, we hope to have time to bring just the beginning of the, the mockery that starts as Jesus is arrested and begins that mock um, judgment um, that, will, that will follow until the moment where he's sent to Calvary. This is what's happening. It's the power of darkness that is acting, that is being let loose. In a few Sundays now, we have been continuing our exposition of Luke, and it's very providential. I'm very thankful for this because it's been serving, in essence, two other purposes. We, we are in the season of passion, and we have arrived in Luke at this very moment in the life of Christ where he begins his suffering in earnest. It was in 2018 that we began our exposition in Luke, and it was in the in the event of the season of Christmas, so it was in December of 2018, and now, now we are about to end Luke, and we are ending around the Passion season of 2022. But then the other purpose that, that has been, at least for a few Sundays, um, as we're looking at the Lord's Days, and we have arrived now at the very sufferings of Christ in Article 4 of the Apostles' Creed, which is all about the suffering of Christ. And so we're hoping to consider um, that first question of, of Lord's Day 15. The very next question is even pertaining to, to the suffering under Pilate. So we will be considering um, each question throughout future sermons. And so, verse 53, the Lord Jesus says... This is why you're here. This is your hour and the power of darkness. Let's look at the arrest of Christ and then we'll look at the denial of Christ and then the mocking of Christ in order as we follow in our text. So Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives last Lord's Day. We, we began seeing the, the prayer of Christ, that great and intense agony in which Christ was in, where even drops of blood were mingling with his sweat as he pled with the Father if the cup could pass from him. Remember, we saw the reality that that was not a moment of, of weakness of Christ that led him to desire that. Yes, there was humanity in it. There was the struggling with, with all that the cross meant. But asking for that was not a weakness. It was not almost as if somebody could think of, okay, he didn't sin, but he almost did. No, remember, we consider the reality that a pure and perfect man will never desire death. And God would never desire the wrath of God. God the Son knows that this is the intensifying of receiving the wrath of the Father. And He does not desire that. And that is right not to desire. And, and notice when we were reading in the Heidelberg Catechism how there's... 
there's this sense of helping us understand that Christ on this earth was always operating with the sense that because he was being considered a sinner and receiving the sins of God's people, the wrath of God was also becoming just part of how he lived. And, but we don't understand theologically when, when that wrath literally was felt or noticed, if it was only towards the end of his life, but we know that there's a whole reality that he was suffering his whole life because even having come as a human already involved the element of suffering. So I'm going to read again that first question and you'll notice that, that there is a sense that the suffering and the wrath was in a sense already part of the life of Christ, but it intensified now at the end of his life. So question 37 again, what dost thou understand by the words he suffered? That he, all the time that he lived on earth, but especially at the end of his life, sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sins of all mankind. That so by his passion, as the only propitiatory sacrifice, he might redeem our body and soul from everlasting damnation and obtain for us the favor of God, righteousness, and eternal life. So let us begin by looking at the arrest of the Lord Jesus. After he prayed, and after he woke up his disciples three times, he prayed three times, he went back to his disciples, they were sleeping three times. At the third, he said, wake up, they are coming. And verse 47 starts, where while he's still speaking to his disciples that, that the time is running out, that group of people, that mob, the, the servants of the high priest, the temple guard, they arrived with, with um, swords and with staves and with torches, we read elsewhere. And they, they came to find where Jesus was. Um, and, John, and Judas was the leader. Because what's happening now is the betrayal of Judas will culminate. It will be fulfilled. In a sense, he's already betrayed Jesus because he made that pact. We've been following in all the other sermons where, where he left. He went and talked to the priests and he covenanted with them for 30 pieces of silver that he would let them know where he is at an opportune time. That, that was the betrayal, in a sense, um, settled, but it hadn't been fulfilled. While Judas was there at the Lord's table, remember Jesus told everyone, the betrayer is right here with us. And somewhere in the part of the Lord's Supper, he told Judas that which you will do, do quickly. And he went to go tell the authorities where they could find Jesus. And now he comes. And he comes having told that group, the one I kiss is the one you want. So he was ready to betray Jesus with a kiss. Now, betrayal is something that other servants of the Lord have also suffered. And, and I'm going to return to this reality, beloved. When, you, when we ask the question, why was a betrayal necessary? There's an element here that connects to you and me in a, in a very specific way. Perhaps not to every believer, but certainly to every single one of those who have been betrayed. But then it does apply to every single believer. And that, remember, we've touched on this when, I've, when we started the subject of betrayal because we start seeing this early when, when Judas goes and starts deciding to betray. Remember that reality that every single sin, especially sin of believers, is a betrayal. And so... Let me come back to this soon, but let me give you this example of someone who was betrayed. Someone that, that you know of, you have heard of, William Tyndale. He was greatly used of God to translate the scriptures from Hebrew and Greek. Um, Wycliffe had, about a hundred years earlier, translated the Bible into um, English, but he had used mainly the Latin texts. He he didn't know Greek and Hebrew good enough to go to well enough to go back to the ancient texts. 
But William Tyndale, he did know Hebrew and Greek, and so he did rely a little bit upon the Bible in English that Wycliffe had already done, but he, he literally started from scratch, Hebrew and Greek, and translated into English. But for that very purpose, he was wanted in England for having translated the Bible. Can you imagine living in a society? Again, we think of the difficulties of our day, but imagine living in those days where if you dare to translate the Bible and offer it to people, it was considered a capital crime. Tyndale was being wanted to be executed for having provided the Bible in English. And there were people who, who were looking for him all over the place. And he was living um, in, a, in, a, in a hiding kind of way, a secret kind of way. And one Henry Phillips, in greed, he accepted to be Dre Tyndale for a um, good sum of money. And he was a friend of Tyndale. Tyndale had trusted him, and he had invited him into his hideouts. And one day... Phillips agreed to go into a narrow passageway where the enemies were waiting, and they captured Tyndale. Now, Tyndale not only was betrayed in a similar way as Jesus, but he also responded like Jesus. Um, Jesus did not revenge against Judas in, in his human experience. But he just went the way of the arrest. And that's what Tyndale did. And one of his, his very last communication from prison, Tyndale says this. Let me just read this for you to get the spirit of Christ in Tyndale. I beg your lordship by the Lord Jesus that if I am to remain here through the winter, you will request a commissary, commissary, to have the kindness to send me from the goods of mine, which, which he has, a warmer cap, for I suffer greatly from cold in the head, a warmer coat also, for this which I have is very thin. My overcoat is worn out. My shirts are also worn out. He has a woolen shirt, if he will be good enough to send it. And I ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening, it is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark, but most of all, I beg and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the commissary that he will kindly permit me to have the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew grammar, and the Hebrew dictionary, that I may pass the time in that study. I will be patient, aboding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important that we remember, boys and girls, you have a Bible in your hand in the English language. And many of the words in that very Bible are exactly the same as when Tyndale translated it. There were some words that were made more modern and some corrections that were made from his own translation. But many of the versions, not only the King James Version, but even other, other versions, still, still contain the bulk of what this man, who wrote this letter before he died, um, he translated into English. And he was betrayed before he died, much like the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus was betrayed, and, and see, this is, this is what betrayal means. And remember, we saw this, an enemy doesn't betray, because an enemy is an enemy. Betrayal is what a friend does, or someone who pretends to be a friend. And, and in the case of Judas, there was even a heightened, he does it with a kiss. A kiss is to show love, but he was using that demonstration of love as a demonstration of the fulfillment and the, the, the climactic element of his betrayal because that would be the way to find out who the man was that they were supposed to arrest and Matthew Henry says um, about this about this this use of a kiss for the betrayal he says was ever a love token so desecrated and abused nothing can be a greater affront or grief to the Lord Jesus than to be betrayed and betrayed with a kiss by those that profess relation to him and an affection for him. Now, two things 
before we, we move on, two things concerning the betrayal. Um, notice, notice with this betrayal the power of a sinful heart. Like the power, of course, to do evil. Because you think of Judas and who he was. He had the ability to reject the solid teaching of Jesus. Having been so close to Jesus and having heard many of the sermons that perhaps he preached only to that group of people and not to the masses. He was in everything. He heard parables about greed. He heard parables about the cost of discipleship. He heard parables about the kingdom and what it was. He, 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 and, and then there were elements not only about the pre- teaching, but, but also um, of Christ doing things that proved that what he was doing or teaching was so true. And right, he, he was protected in that storm. He would have been in that ship where they were about to drown, but then Jesus calmed the waters and all of a sudden everything was well. He, he, he owed his life to this man already. And as they arrive in that um, other side of, of the Lake of Galilee and they meet with that man who had that legion of demons, you have to realize that every time he pacified a heart that was possessed of demons, that demon, that, that man could have brought danger to all of them. And so not only was God, Jesus, protecting the man who was delivered, he was protecting all the people round about that man who would have had demons in him. He was fed together with the 5,000. He he was given gifts like what the other disciples had, the apostles, when they went. And they also performed miracles. And so with, with all of that theological baggage, he was still able to go and betray Jesus. So it shows that if you have an unconverted heart, it doesn't matter how much theology, it doesn't matter how many sermons, it doesn't matter how many miracles, it doesn't matter even if to some degree you have done miracles, it doesn't matter how much you've seen the protection of God, an unconverted heart is a dead heart. And when it pretends to be a servant of Jesus, it can betray even Jesus. So this is what we see with him. We see the power of a sinful heart. A sinful heart needs to be made right and be made new. And then that power is dead and gone to do evil. And now it has power even to do good and to do right. Now, the second thing um, about the betrayal is to think of why it was necessary. And in this, I want to return to what I brought as a little introduction not too long ago. The first reason that we can think of is that it was fulfillment of prophecy. There had to be a betrayal in the lineup of everything that Jesus suffered because there were prophecies that that would happen to the Messiah. One of them we have sung through, Psalm 41, and it's especially in verse 9. Let me read Psalm 41, verse 9. It says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, that means my close friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his seal against me. This is, this is a direct prophecy of the betrayal of the Messiah. And then the other psalm is Psalm 55. And there we have several verses, beginning in verse 12 through um, verse 14. So Psalm 55, verse 12, we read, For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, that means a man like myself, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. So acquaintance means one with whom Jesus was familiar. 
Um, sweet counsel together means sweet fellowship. Um, they had had moments where they exchanged, exchanged pleasantries, the way they talked to each other. There was a sweetness about it. There was a pleasantness about it. There was a moment where it seemed like Judas perhaps didn't have this heart and intent, but was thinking maybe there's something to this. He, he was a Jewish man. He was religious and he, he was following the Lord Jesus. There was perhaps a sincerity at the beginning, but he was not a true believer. And he never became one. And so what started happening is the moment he realized that his expectations would not be met in the Lord Jesus, he turned on him. And he became aggressive. He became intent upon profit. And see, just one little word. See, in the man, um, Judas, he had everything that a human has when he is lost. He's just thinking of this world. He's thinking of the here and now. He is thinking of what is visible and solid and material. He wanted a throne. He wanted a crown. He wanted Jesus to be a king so that he could sit on his right or left. He was already the treasurer of that little group. Imagine if he was the treasurer of a kingdom. And so when the Lord Jesus did not amass an army to himself, and he, he, he was, of course, into everything, and he saw that Jesus had absolutely no true political agenda at all. And remember, we saw this, that when Jesus started even saying, by the way, I am soon going to die. And when he sees that woman coming and anointing the Lord Jesus, in his mind, he's thinking she's wasting so much money, I could sell that, and then keep the money in my purse and use it for myself. But instead, she's pouring it all on him. And Jesus explained, yes, she's anointing me for my burial. So all of a sudden, the predictions of his death become very visible. And in one of the Gospels, it was right after that moment that he goes and talks to the authorities. Because he realized that there will be no palace, there will be no throne. Maybe there can be at least 30 pieces of silver. So that was the betrayal. But then this leads to the resistance. And let, let us talk about this very short. This is part of the arrest still. But there's this moment where, where the apostles have a moment of resisting. And, and it seems that, that of all of them, Peter is the only one who has some kind of action that is really more, more intent in resisting what's happening. You notice that um, after Jesus um, re Approaches Judas regarding the kiss. He says, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Verse 49, it says, When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said to him, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? So there were some asking, but we, we, we know in other texts it shows that it was Peter. In verse 50 it says, And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So this disciple did not wait to see what Jesus would say. He already had his sword unsheathed and he struck this servant and, and bruised his ear. He cut it off. Well, that, that was the resistance. And, and we understand through the text that it was completely unnecessary. We hear elsewhere that Judas makes it clear that if he needed help, he could call many angels to come. He didn't need um, Peter's help. But the, perhaps the, the worst problem is that it was absolutely wrong. Because to keep Jesus from the cross was in many ways what Satan had been trying to do. So you would not be helping or working in behalf of God. You would be working in behalf of Satan. Um, one commentary, Kent Hughes, says this commenting on Peter's use of the sword, that it was an action which, however well meant, is nevertheless directed against the very ground and basis of the world's salvation. So it was, it was utterly wrong for Peter to do that. But it, then it does provide for us an opportunity um, for, for good instruction. Because when, when this happens, verse 51, Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. So he does stop his disciple from continuing. Then he touches his, the ear of this servant and healed him. And 
in this healing, and, and this is the next thing that we can talk about, the, the healing, we, we have something very powerful here. This is settling the matter that the Christian religion has nothing to do with its expansion in terms of violence. In your mind, you think, well, that is obvious, but it's never, it hasn't been always obvious in the history of the church. There has been so many afflictions and so much bloodshed in the history of Christianity by not interpreting well this very passage. And Jesus, in healing this man, see, in, in doing this, he is proving that he is doing good. The Lord Jesus was not here to promote a violent insurrection. He was not here leading a rebellion against Rome. He, he had no violent intent. See, the, the moment that a sword was brandished, he commanded it to be sheathed. The year that had been stricken, the Lord Jesus immediately heals and then to the very man who came to arrest him, he gives himself in. Um, it, nothing could be farther from the truth that Christianity, for it to expand, may sometimes make use of the sword. No, Christ is making that very clear. In one of the Gospels, what Jesus also said regarding the sword is, the one who uses the sword will perish by the sword. So he made that very clear. And then the last part is that Jesus then turns to those who came to arrest them and he explains to them why they are there. They are there because it's their hour. And it's the power of darkness. And this is how I began the sermon. sermon. But now we, we arrived here in verse 53. And, and this is very important. It's really, it's really teaching you and me why all of this is happening. It's because God is allowing the domain of darkness. This is what the hour of darkness is, is really speaking of. A, a domain, a realm. Um, there are two things we can say about this hour of darkness or this power of darkness. The first is... The simple reality that this is the realm of unbelief itself. It's not immediately just speaking about Satan and only him. It's really the realm of unbelief. If someone who is unsaved and dear unbelieving friends. See, you need to understand this. If you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are right now, theologically speaking, spiritual reality of your life, you are part of this realm of darkness. This is what God's Word teaches. Look at what Colossians 1.13 says about God who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. See, that's where every one of us are start in the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And the literal is in the kingdom of the son of his love. There are two realms in the world, the realm of darkness, the realm of the kingdom of God's son. There is absolutely no in-between moment. The moment you are converted, you are translated kingdoms immediately. There's no transfer of kingdoms where, where it's a gray realm. There, the Bible does not teach. There isn't a narrow way and a wide way and a somewhat in-between way. No. Only two ways. Those two homes that are built on two foundations, there's no third foundation. There's no rock slash sandy foundation. It's either sandy foundation or solid rock foundation. And so this is one reality of the hour of darkness. That's, that's really where everyone who's an unbeliever is in that very realm. But then the second reality that we can think of is, is the, the totality of the spiritual reality of, of darkness, where, yes, it is, it is the realm of Satan himself. This is from Ephesians 6, 12. And this is why Paul says there that we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So this is why as we preach... We always have this sense of urgency that if you are not converted, you must be born again. 
because you cannot stay in that realm any longer. It is dangerous. You do not know if tomorrow you will believe. You do not die. And you will go from, from this earthly existence where perhaps you don't see the darkness, but if you die without Christ, you will see the darkness and it will be eternal. So you see, a preacher who would preach in a way where you have time and, and leave you to yourself and, 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 and kind of just say, you know, if God will save you, he'll save you. It's true that God will save you by his sovereignty. But in his word, we see that he uses preachers and he uses the word to urge with your heart that today you would repent and believe. Because you don't want to be in that realm. It's dangerous. It's powerful. You see what it did to Judas. And, and, and now we see what it does even to Peter. And, and this is where, where we enter in. I mean, in a, in a few minutes, I still have a few more things to say about, about what Jesus is explaining here. That this, this hour... This power, okay, it's a realm. It's where Satan operates. It's, it's where he has, in a sense, an element of freedom. It is, it is his kingdom. It is his domain. However, however, there are these two things about it that are so important. It completely operates under the eternal power of God. I, I said that at the very beginning also. See, Jesus is the one declaring to those people whose hour it is. So that shows that Jesus is sovereign over those whose hour it is. It's not like he's saying, okay, now God and I will stay to the side and you can do whatever you want. And then, and then we'll try to come back. No, they, they never leave the, the, the height of what's going on. They are sovereign. They, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are sovereign over this hour. They're, they are the ones who allow this kingdom of darkness to have a moment. And that shows then that, that they never have the upper hand. And then that's the second thing. It is but a moment. We, we never speak of the hour of God, of, of a moment of God. His is eternity, but darkness is an hour. And in boys and girls, it's not meaning an hour, meaning 60 minutes. It is meaning um, all of this suffering. You, you could say it's from the moment that, the, that Satan entered Judas and he goes and covenants with those people. And Jesus is there in Gethsemane and he's sensing um, the, the, the powers of evil upon him because he's, he's feeling the sins of all his people um, mounting upon his heart in the wrath of the Father. And then comes these betrayer, the betrayer with all these people. And, and, and now Peter will pretty soon deny the Lord Jesus. And those men are going to mock and smite Jesus. So it's, that's more than an hour. And so the word hour doesn't mean just 60 minutes, but it's speaking of a limited time. And, and that's the blessing. See, it's Jesus who announces it's their time. And it's only an hour. It is not eternal. God's moment is eternal. The darkness has a limited time. That's just so precious about what Jesus is saying. Now, um, one more thing before we move on. And this is also very important. Why was the betrayal necessary? I mentioned because every sin is a betrayal. But also this, every sin is part of that realm, is part of that darkness. See, when you sin and I sin, we are doing that which is proper. Proper in the sense that that's all that happens in darkness. See, in the realm of darkness, think of the realm of Satan. Is there any good, any love, any kindness? Never. Satan doesn't even know what kindness, love is. They, they think that is stupid. They think that is ridiculous. It is a waste of time. The whole concept of loving an enemy, 
Satan can't even conceive of what that means. Sin is life in the realm of darkness. And see, beloved, not what every sin is, but darkness is what every sin is. And when we are love and we sin, we, we are doing what people do in this realm, and it is normal to be done. And this is one thing then that should help a Christian realize that sin has nothing to do with my heart and yours. If you say you believe in the Lord Jesus, you should say, Lord, take away every sin from my heart, not only forgiving it, but also keeping me from it. Help me, Lord Jesus. I don't want to do something that they do in that realm, and it is is the way of living in that realm. So this is... This is what Jesus is saying. It is your hour in the power of darkness. Sin is going to just go rampant. Sin against the Lord Jesus. Hell is going to break loose. And this is the next thing that we find. Is that now a disciple who was saved sins in such a sad way. And so see, this is what's happening. Here's a disciple that was really in the realm of darkness and he betrays Jesus. That was surprising. But in a way, when you stop to think, it isn't. He's doing what they do in the realm of darkness. But then in verse 54 on, it's Peter. Peter enters the scene. And he was the disciple who had confessed Jesus first that he is the Christ when Jesus asked. He is the disciple that walked on water toward the Lord Jesus. Granted, his faith began to fail, but he did walk a few steps at least. He's a disciple who said a few moments ago, Lord, I am willing to go to prison and even to die in your behalf. And and he was not lying when he said that. It, It was a desire in his heart sword, and that kind of proved the point. He wasn't kidding. When the Lord Jesus saw many disciples leaving, he turned to his disciples and said, Are y'all going to leave also? And Peter is the one who said, Where else would we go? Thou art the one who has the words of eternal life. But now Peter sees, the Bible says, a little maid. And she says, You were one with him. And he says, I know him not. And then another person comes and says, You were also of them. And he said, I am not. Someone else came and said, Your language, your your accent, and you, you look like a Galilean. You're one of them. And he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And in other Gospels, it says that he even swore and cursed to prove his point. Not only did he deny Jesus three times, he denied Jesus in three different ways. He said this, the question was, this man was with him. He said, I know him not. They asked, you are also of them. He said, I am not. And then one said, you were with him. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He he denied being with Jesus. He denied the Lord Jesus. And he denied even any knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So he denied fellowship with Jesus, discipleship with Jesus, and even any acquaintance with Jesus. That's what Peter did. Now see, the, the... What you need to understand that I'm not trying to say that I can't, I don't have the theological knowledge to put in a a weighing system and see is his sin worse than Judas. It's not what I'm trying to do. But you have to realize the reality of what's happening. Judas was in that realm. And he did what people do in that realm. It's darkness. And he betrayed. But Peter is in the realm of the Son of God's love. And he denies Jesus three times in all of these intense ways. So he did what people do in the realm of darkness. 
And all I'm meaning with this is to show the power of darkness, that it can make a friend of Jesus, someone who is saved by Jesus. See, someone who, who now has the help even of the Lord Jesus and even the prayers of the Lord Jesus. But how weak we are in ourselves without the Lord Jesus. That we would deny the Lord Jesus. And now I hope to return to, to this denial. There's so much we can fit, consider to the third point, the mocking of Christ. Because this, this brings, in a sense, a, a triad of, of suffering that the Lord Jesus is enduring in this, trying to show this reality. Here's one from the realm of darkness. Here's one from the realm of light. And now when Jesus turns himself in and, and he is there um, beginning to be judged by the high priest, notice what happens. Verse 63, treating him like an animal. There, there is even no decision if he's guilty or not guilty. And they're already bringing the, the sentence upon him. The sense that you have here is that all hell has broken loose upon him. And God has allowed it. To be so. And the reason I, I, I dare use a, an expression like this is because, beloved, see, this is what is literally happening. Boys and girls, never should we say what I just said, using the word hell and saying broke loose about things in this world. If you see a car crash, and we shouldn't talk that high in a way that may be very familiar. But Jesus is in the hands of men who have devils behind them. Look what Matthew Henry says. He says, hell was let loose. And Jesus suffered it to do its worst. A greater indignity could not be done to the blessed Jesus, yet this was one instance of many. You see, this is the hour of darkness. And you see one man betraying, another denying, and when he's in the hands of all his enemies, they act literally like demons in Jesus, and it's like he's in hell already. See, theologically, this is where Jesus, along, of course, with, with the cross being always the climax, but it's like he's already experiencing hell. See, this is one question to answer. Why now mockery? Betrayal, denial, why mockery now? Because, beloved, this in, in many ways, this is a picture of hell. You think the devils will give a good time and, and welcome people who are there? No, mocking is part of how they make you suffer if you're there. And so Jesus is there in a spiritual way here on earth. But he's experiencing it. And that, beloved, is like a full circuit. And it, it'll still continue showing the hour of darkness. But I want to end just with these few thoughts. And they're basically three points. Just proving one point. The one point is simply this. In the midst of all of this, the power and control of the Lord Jesus. It's, it's been all throughout if you go back to the Lord's table, it is there that he declares a betrayal. But he continues to serve the bread and the wine, pointing to his body and blood. And then they are arguing about position and they're greedy to see who would be the first. And the Lord Jesus, after he tells them to be servants, he does promise to them that there will be a kingdom and thrones Luke twenty two thirty 30, and authority to judge. And then when he tries to help Paul, P Peter, because of his denial, he tells him, I prayed for you. Just even in the midst of his suffering and agony, he's ministering, he's serving. And, and now just this, in the three moments that we saw, the, the arrest with his betrayal, the denial, and now the mockery. See, in the midst of the betrayal, Jesus tells those very people why they're there. He's the one who's 
who's organizing the whole situation. He tells them why they are there. They, they think they know why they are there. But Jesus is the one who tells them, yes, it is your hour and the power of darkness. He proved that he was in complete control. You came to arrest me, but I'm the one turning myself in. Remember, John has the powerful reality how they all fall back. And when Jesus waits for them to get back up, he turns himself in. And the second moment is in the midst of the denial. You know, I, I didn't have time to go through everything, but just this. As, as Christ himself is in there with, with those hellish fiends, he still takes the time when he hears the cock crow and he understands, okay, he denied me three times. He looks out and, boys and girls, maybe, maybe there was a big gate through which Jesus could see the outer court and he could fix his eye upon Jesus or one of the windows. But while Jesus is there betraying, while Peter is there betraying Jesus, when Jesus hears the cock crow, Jesus looks back and he sees Peter. And Peter sees Jesus. So while Jesus is in the agony of his suffering and mockery, he is sending compassion and love and mercy to Peter. Even if there may be elements of rebuke in that look, as some commentators may say, I, I, I really do believe with other commentators that the compassion was certainly paramount because Peter goes and repents. He does what is right. And then while Jesus is still in the hour of darkness, surrounded by those mockers, what did Jesus do then? And you could say, well, what did Jesus do then? I just hear of everything they did. Jesus did absolutely nothing. He was silent and beloved. See, this is the power of it all. Even there, he was doing what he had to do. He was enduring the pain. Being reviled, he reviled not again. And, and he fulfilled in his silent Jeremiah, Isaiah 53, 7. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. The hour of darkness is powerful. But God's power is greater. The darkness has only a moment. God has eternity. And beloved, one, one word of, of application. You may very well be suffering this darkness in your life one way or another. You know, when a believer walks through the valley of the shadow of death, either because of hatred from people, diseases that are being battled, whatever realm of affliction that you're going through, you can be certain that there may be elements of darkness where this realm is acting and oppressing and tempting you. But be encouraged and don't be dismayed because Christ's power is greater still. He's the one in control. See, it's, it's this very darkness that explains the wars that we see, the sin that seems to prevail in schools, in capital buildings, in companies, in nations. But the Lord Jesus went to the cross for that very purpose. So that there would be forgiveness for sins. And the cleansing of souls. And even if we continue in afflictions, if you have Christ, you are safe. And that's what matters. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God Almighty. In the midst, Lord, of the power of darkness that we do see in the world, often, Lord, we see afflicting our own souls. We plead and we pray that thou would cause our eyes to fix upon Jesus, who went there 
for us, who, who was in that realm as a sacrifice so that we would never be not only in that realm or in that place physically after we die. Lord, we pray that thou would be with all those whom thou knowest need to be translated from the kingdom of darkness, Lord, to the kingdom of the Son of thy love, and we plead with thee that thou, Lord, would powerfully do it. Do not allow, Lord, these souls to remain another instant, another moment in such a dangerous and lowly and sad and dark place, but that they would look to the Lord Jesus and be saved, that they would trust this Savior and Messiah. As we read in the catechism, who was, who was receiving all this suffering, Lord, because he was receiving all thy wrath, so that our sin... We pray, Lord, that thou would cause such souls to look to Jesus, who looks to them in the gospel. If, if Jesus looked to Peter while he was there being assailed, how much more we can trust that he looks to us while he is in heaven at thy right hand. So we pray, O oh Lord, caused by faith that there may be lowly souls who feel like they have sinned very grievously, who, who are saved, and yet they feel so guilty for their sin. Lord, may they have this look of Christ upon their very souls, that they would be is looking at them because he looks at sinners. He takes time, even in his suffering, how much more now in his glory. And we pray then, Lord, that thou would both strengthen believers and save unbelievers all for thine honor and glory. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 366 in our doxology is 113, stanzas 11 through 12. The last two stanzas of 113 in Psalter 366.